Good morning, everyone. Well, it's Pentecostal Sunday. I, the other day, someone told me, you're supposed to wear red on Pentecostal Sunday. I'm looking out for the red. I'm a good thing I found. I got my brothers wearing ties over there. So, <laughs> uh, Let's open up with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this morning. It is a beautiful morning. For, uh, we're rem- remembering the Spirit, Father, and how you empowered your people and uh, the fulfillment of your promises, Father. And we pray that you just be with this service, be with the words spoken and the songs sang, and may your Spirit fall on us, Father. In your precious and holy name we pray, amen. We're going to sing a song. It's in the blue book. It's uh, 227. Everyone please stand. It's It's on the screens too. It's a little slower, but this is... Something to get us in the mood for today's service. So we would like to change the order of service just just for a minute, and we'd like to recognize some graduates. So Rebecca, would you come up and stand in her place? Come on, Rebecca. Haley. There's Haley. No, you come on up here. You're good. Rebecca and Haley were college graduates, and Macy. Oh, there's Macy. And Macy, don't even take a seat. Come on down. Macy is our high school graduate. We want to congratulate uh, these ladies for hard work. Uh, they've dedicated their time. I know you've got 12 years out of the way, and you going to college? Yeah, four more to go. All right, so we're about done. And then these girls, they're ready. Uh, t- well, you're already in, in the field, right? So doing your thing, right? Okay, <laughs> so that's good. That's good. But what I'd like to do, you know, we gave them from the church a token of pre- appreciation, congratulating them for their graduation. But... Can we stand and pray for them? Because they're going down avenues that we've been before. Some of us have, some of us haven't. But it's hard. It's not easy. And we need the Lord in everything that we do, right? So if we can pray for these young ladies, um, let's do that now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for the opportunity, Lord Jesus, to be able to celebrate graduation of our youth high school and college. We thank you, Lord, for that. Lord Jesus, you are a God that goes before. And we just asked you, and Lord, we thank you, Lord, for going before uh, in each individual life of these young ladies. And Lord, I pray, Father, that they keep a sensitive heart and they keep open ears and an open mind, Lord, not to the world, but to that of you. Without you, Father, just quite frankly, it's pointless. Lord, of all things that they hear me say today is that they always put you first. 
and they always do what you say to do, even when it don't necessarily make sense. Because you are, once again, a God who goes before. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity of celebration and give you all the praise and we give you all the glory. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Good morning, everybody. Um, as you all know, we have hired a children's pastor and his family to, to help us grow with all these kids that we have, that we've been blessed with. But we also have a young lady that has helped us for many years, and we'd like to recognize her this morning. Miss Georgia, can you come up here? That's just what we do. Yeah. All right. So Georgia has helped, as you all know, for many years with our quizzing, with our kids, VBS, anything she's been asked. I get emotional because, bless her heart, she's always been there for me. So from your church family, we just want to let you know we love you and thank you for all that you've done for us. Just because we have a children's pastor doesn't mean you're done. Oh, no. Oh, no. I'm still <laughs> doing it. I'm still doing it. The Lord's not finished with me yet. That's right. Thank you all. All right. Everyone, please stand. We're singing 315, He Abides. I realized I sang this song a little earlier when I first started. And uh, singing it again this morning, going over, I'm like, well, I just I sang this song pretty recently. But it's very applicable to what today is. So, Amen. Amen. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way For the hand of God in all my life I see And the reason of my bliss, yes, the secret all is this That the Comforter abides with me He abides, He abides, hallelujah, He abides with me I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. Once my heart was full of sin, once I had no peace within, till I heard how Jesus died upon the tree. Then I fell down at his feet, and there came a peace so sweet, now the Comforter abides with me. He abides, he abides. Hallelujah, he abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. He is with me everywhere, and he knows my every care. I'm as happy as a bird and just as free. For the Spirit has control, Jesus satisfies my soul, since the Comforter abides with me. He abides, He abides, hallelujah, He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. There's no thirsting for the things of the world, they've taken wings. Long ago I gave them up and instantly... All my night was turned to day, all my burdens rolled away, now the Comforter abides with me. He abides, He abides, hallelujah, He abides with me. I'm rejoicing night and day as I walk the narrow way, for the Comforter abides with me. I've been singing that all week. Emmanuel, he's with us. Amen. I meant to uh, do this before I started singing, but I was doing some things of what's Pentecost in our hymnal, and uh, I thought we'd do a responsive reading. I mentioned it before we started, but it's the Pentecost responsive reading, so I mean, you can only do it one time a year, I guess. <laughs> so uh, It's uh, 292 in your books, and the you'll say the bold after I say the non-bold, I guess what you would say would be. Get us to get our minds set for 
and what the day really is. All right. Jesus said to his disciples, I am going to send you what my father has promised, but say in Jerusalem until stay in Jerusalem until you have been clothed with power from on high. When the day of Pentecost came, Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire and that separated and came to rest on each of them. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children. For all Amen. This next song is How the Fire Fell. And I, can, I can see how this would be a little confusing to some of our younger kids, but that's why we're wearing red. It's, it's the fire, and, uh, and here it says, The fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, and that's a callback to our Old Testament. There's so much imagery and uh, stuff going back to the New Testament, and we're called to be that sacrifice on the altar. Amen. And the fire will come down and give us power. Amen. Oh, I love to tell the blessed story since the Lord sanctified me. For my soul received a flood of glory when the Lord sanctified me. Oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell, how the fire fell, how the fire fell. Oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell when the Lord sanctified me. All my doubts and fears are gone forever since the Lord sanctified me. For his peace flowed o'er me like a river when the Lord sanctified me. Oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell, how the fire fell, how the fire fell. Oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell when the Lord sanctified me. The world no more my heart is turning since the Lord sanctified me for on me his spirit fell with burning since the Lord sanctified me oh I never shall forget how the fire fell how the fire fell how the fire fell oh I never shall forget how the fire fell when the Lord sanctified me. There's a crown awaiting me in heaven since the Lord sanctified me. For a heart made clean to me was given when the Lord sanctified me. Oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell, how the fire fell, how the fire fell. Oh, I never shall forget how the fire fell when the Lord sanctified me. I just want to say I praise the Lord this morning. If I fumble this song, just ignore me but listen to the words um, I thank him and praise him this song this week as I've sung over and over it's not forgotten who I was and where I came from and what he saved me from I pray it touches your heart
was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you held me in your sight so you made a way across the great divide left heaven's throne to build it here inside and there at the cross you paid the debt i owe broke my chains freed my soul for the first time i had hope thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus it has washed me white thank you jesus you have saved into glorious light you took my place laid inside my tomb of sin you were buried for three days and then you walked back out again and now death has no sting and life has no end for i have been transformed by the blood of the lamb thank you jesus for the blood applied thank you jesus you have Well, this morning, if you have your Bibles with you, Leviticus chapter 6 is where I'll be at. Leviticus chapter 6, you're probably saying Pentecost Sunday, <laughs> Leviticus, that's what the Lord said. <laughs> so, oh, me, after you found it, would you stand out of reverence of God's word, Leviticus chapter 6. 
And we'll be starting in verse 8, Leviticus chapter 6, verse 8, and the word of the Lord says this, The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his sons, saying, The law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night until morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. Verse 10, and the priest shall put on his linen garment and put his linen undergarment on his body and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them aside, uh, beside the altar. Verse 11, then he shall take off his garment and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it, and shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings. Verse 13, fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the songs that we have heard this morning. We, we thank you, Lord, how you have spoken, how you have moved. We are thankful for the blood, the sacrifice that you have given. We are thankful that the Comforter, Lord, abides with us. And so, Lord, thank you for what you are going to do. Lord, I pray, I pray this morning, Lord, you have your way. I pray, Lord, you help me as I preach your word, that it's not me, but, Lord, that it is you and you alone. And I pray, Lord, for every distraction that might be here. Lord, would you just touch now? Help us to stay focused upon you. Because, Lord, we trust you this morning. And, Lord, we're going to give you praise for everything that you do. We ask these things in Jesus' name. We all say together, amen. amen. You may be seated. There has always been something intriguing about fire. I don't know if you realize that, if you've ever had children, especially boys. For some reason, they are more tempted to be pyromaniacs. Uh, it grabs, really, the attention of everybody around this fire. The gas explosion, if you remember back in, in Lincoln County back in 19, y'all remember that? And it, it was unbelievable. They said that the flames reached as high as 300 feet straight in the air. That's as tall as the Statue of Liberty. Uh, I don't know if you remember this, but I was visiting sometime later, if just about a week later, up at uh, the UK hospital. And someone had took a picture from UK hospital and posted it on Facebook. And you could see the flame in Lincoln County. Wow. That's unbelievable. The thing about it is you can't taste it. I wouldn't try. <laughs> you can't smell it. You can't hear it. But it's powerful. Powerful enough to wipe out a forest and leave nothing in its path. And yet bright enough for one small flame to light up a room in a dark house. It's unbelievable, this thing that we talk about and call fire. In 1997, there was a thing in China, and it made the headlines all around the world because in 1997, that was the year I graduated high school, all you graduates. Woo! Some of y'all are saying, man, you're a pup, and some of the others are saying, you're old as dirt. So, I mean, either one is fine. But in 1997, China put out a fire that started in the year 1560. Think about it, that's over 430 years of a constant fire. China finally put it out in 1997. Could you imagine a fire that would be rolling that long? Man, it, it was a coal bed fire. And so if you know anything about China, China is one of the largest producers in the world of coal. But uh, coal beds can start and uh, all of a sudden catch fire underground. And when they do, sometimes, as in this case, 430 years later, it's still going. And eventually they did 
put out that fire. It, it consumed in that time frame over 127 million tons of coal. That's a lot. <laughs> you see, the main thing with fire that we are taught at a very young age in school is to get rid of it. You either stop the flow of oxygen or you stop the fuel that it feeds on. This morning... I want to preach a message that's called this, how's your fire looking? How's your fire looking? Leviticus is a book that sometimes we can look at and say, do we really have to read that? Is, is Leviticus something that really we need to go through? We understand the Jews. We understand that some of them still don't believe that Jesus has come back. And so, man, they take the five, first five books of the Bible, I mean, more serious than we could even grasp. But now remember, if they don't believe Jesus has come, they've still missed it. <laughs> the song just told us, right? Only through the blood of Jesus, right? That's how we make it to heaven, but... So uh, looking at Leviticus, man, there, there's a lot of law that goes into play here. There's a lot of things that are happening. But this morning, the, the Lord has led to this spot, I believe, for a reason. So as I was studying through this, whoo, boy, it, it's, it's pretty amazing. God's pretty smart, by the way. I don't know if you all realize that or not. Sometimes it takes me a while to realize, man, he actually knows what he's doing. <laughs> oh, baby. Really, I want to make mention that before this passage right here, you have verses 8 through 13. And the word fire only occurs one time in these chapters up to this point. So from the first book of Leviticus, I mean the first chapter of Leviticus, up to this point, it only the word fire only appears one time. And that's in chapter 3 and verse 5. And you'll see that it talks about fire. The rest of the time, all they talk about is burnt offerings. But the word fire comes into play. In the passage I just read here in chapter 6, fire is mentioned four times in six verses. I believe God's trying to make a point in what he is saying this morning. So you look in verse 8, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, God's still speaking with and through Moses to be able to lead the people to the place they need to be. Uh, remember, Moses would be, as Scripture would tell us, the meekest man in the world. And so God would use the meekest man in the world to be able to lead a rebellious people that's led all throughout Scripture, that rebellious people out of the land of Egypt into the promised land. He would use Moses to do that. The thing that we have to remember about Moses is this. Do not mistake Moses' meekness for weakness. Grab hold of that again. Do not mistake Moses' meekness for weakness. And by the way, do not take for granted someone else's meekness in the church that the Lord has bestowed on them for weakness because those two are not the same. They're actually very opposite. And so here we see that God is speaking to him and he's giving him some commands. He's giving him the instructions. He's giving him things that we think about nowadays and we say this is crazy. Moses had to go through all this, had to memorize all this, had to make sure everything was done right, had to make sure the right people were put in place because this person could, this person couldn't, these people did, these people didn't. I don't know if you remember much about numbers, but if you look at numbers, uh, Moses was called on after they erected the tabernacle in, in the uh, desert that everybody had their jobs. Well, Moses had his job too, and Aaron had their job too. You know what it was? Anyone who was not supposed to be close to the tabernacle that came in they killed them that was their job that's what God gave to them that's your job because this he says is a sacred place and not just anybody can be in this place God takes who he is very serious as well <laughs> because he is a holy God here in verse 9 he says command Aaron and his son saying Aaron and his sons they would be set aside by God as priests they would be the Levitical tribe, and God would use them 
to be able to raise up the priest of that day. And Aaron would be the leader and his sons would come right in behind. And they would be able to do the part of what God wanted them to do. And so they would keep the fire going and the burnt offering, it says, they would keep going. And so they would have this job that they would continually do. So this, and I understand this was a 24-hour process of what they're doing here, of this burnt offering. Remember, the fire can't go out. Anybody ever been camping? Right. Anybody ever had the job of taking care of the fire? What do some people tell you if you're going to take care of the fire? Especially if there's bears around, right? So that's the main thing you don't want to do, let the fire go out. I don't want to let it go out if there's raccoons around either, so don't do that. But, man, it, it says on down in verse 9, it says, The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night until the morning. All night to the morning. So understand what they would do with the sacrifice. With the sacrifice, God had stipulated different times for different pieces to be burned because the fat that would be set up on the altar would also be used as fuel to keep the flame going. And they would burn piece after piece after piece. I don't know about you, but I'm thinking if there's ever a boring job, it's just landed on the altar. But God says this is very important. Sometimes, looking in the church, we may think that a job is not very important, but God says, really, if you want to think about it, it's very important. The smallest job in the church, God says, somebody still has to do it, and I think it's important. And God will use people to do the smallest things. And by the way, sometimes the smallest things make the largest impact in someone's life. Never think that you're too small or the job that you're doing is too mediocre because it's not in God's sight. It's not. There was this aspect of the burning of the sacrifice piece by piece that would also keep that fire going, as I just said, all night long. And then the last part of verse 9 is really so important. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. Uh, there's this part that God wants them to understand. Make sure it keeps going. Make sure the fire is burning. Make sure it doesn't go out. And so God makes sure that they understand that Moses is going to repeat to them, that they would repeat to somebody else, that all the people would understand that the fire needs to be kept going. See, they had to pay attention to what was going on. Realize this. When we're taking care of things, if you lose focus, then you lose out on what's actually happening. And realize this as well. When you lose focus, bad things happen. You don't believe that? Try driving down the road and lose focus. I, I was visiting the other day, and I was driving around a curve. And all of a sudden, I met another car in the curve. And in that car was a person. I'll not say who it is because I don't know who it was. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, they came around. And as they came around, I'm like, uh, well, this road is not very wide. Where do I go? Because the person driving the vehicle had a phone in their face like this in a curve trying to take the curve. Losing focus. You ever seen people lose focus on the road? Boy, it don't take just a second. God would make sure that the fire of, of the altar would continually be kept burning. So what really had to be done is they had to pay attention to the fire. Come on. Come on. We're going to get there. I know Leviticus isn't exciting, but maybe it will be here in a minute. So, Whew, Verses 10 and 11. It's really getting ready to get excited then if you thought that was good. So uh, wake up. Don't go to sleep on me. Some of you are already dozing. Whew, just a few minutes longer, a few minutes longer. Verses 10 and 11. <clears throat> you may be asking, Brother Dwayne, what in the world is all of this? So I'm going to read it one more time just so that we have it. And the priest shall put on his linen garment and put his linen undergarment on his body, and he shall take up the ashes to which the fire has reduced the burnt offering on the altar and put them beside the altar and Verse 11, then he shall take off his garments and put on other garments and carry the ashes outside the camp to a clean place. And you're like, man, what? Change clothes, put on clothes, do this, do that. What in the world is God wanting them to do all this for? 
Why in the world would God stipulate a, an aspect of doing this that the priests are going to have to do? It's just ashes. <laughs> it's, just, it's just something they're going to scoop up and take out. But if you were to look back at Exodus 28 and remember all of this starting. So when, when you look at Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, sometimes it's very repetitive. And what God, but anything that repeats, we better take note of it. And so in Exodus 28, it would talk about the priest's garments. They were ve- God was very concerned with what the priest wore. Not only was he just concerned with what the priest wore, he was concerned about how it fit. Not only was he concerned about how it fit, if you were to go back and look at all that, he was concerned about how far it came down, how far it came up, and everything that would be in between. And God says, this is the way it has to be done. Imagine living in the day and age that we live in, because we live in a day and age where the world says, we'll do whatever we want to, no matter what anybody says. And God says, no, no, it has to be done the way I say it needs to be done. See, we always need to remember God's in control. And when God says, I need it to be done this way, there's a purpose for it. There's a reason for it. And so Exodus 28, we see this, that the priest's garment that would be made for them, somebody made their garments. They didn't make them. Somebody made it for them. And you want to know how the people made it for them? Man, God is really into this whole thing of garment making. It's crazy. Some of y'all are like, what? Well, in Exodus chapter 28, verse 3, it says this. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. God, I think you're taking this just a little bit too serious. You actually, listen, you actually filled someone with the spirit of skill to make a garment? By the way, we do the same thing today. You would fill that person with the Holy Spirit. Be careful. God was concerned about garments so much that he filled people with the Spirit to be able to make it the exact way it needed to be done. Man, God is meticulous. And, the th- and by the way, don't think when he got to the New Testament, God became lackadaisical. And God just said, well, just whatever way the church wants to be ran. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. He didn't change his way in one little bit. You see, those garments would have been, now watch this, those garments would have been made perfect, and they would have fit perfect, and they would have been used in the perfect way. Oh, now, are you ready? See, we're getting here because, man, God always had a plan since the beginning of time. And so since he was so meticulous about this, that it would be used perfectly, fit perfectly, everything done perfectly, it's no wonder why all of a sudden we get to this and realize that God had set up this foreshadowing of who Jesus was to come. Oh, come on, watch this. Jesus was made perfect in the flesh to pit fit perfect in a lost and dying world, and he was used in the perfect way. Mark chapter 10, verse 45, he would say that he would be a ransom for many. God always had a plan. We look at things and we say, God, you've lost your mind. And he says, you can't even comprehend my mind. I have always had a plan. And even the smallest thing that comes to Aaron's garment, God says there's a, per- uh, there's a reason that I had, and it's perfect. And it's perfect. Man. Whoo. Can I tell you, it's all about the priesthood. Whoo. I preached on this uh, a while back. When did I preach on this? Some other time. I've slept since then, and so what happens is, man, all of a sudden, it's about the priesthood. You see, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 says this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. A minister in the holy places, in the true tent, the Lord set up, not man. Can I go ahead and tell you, God always had a plan. 
even in Leviticus chapter 6. Even in Exodus chapter 28. Talking about how the priest garments should be made. What they shall take off and what they shall put on. And how everything shall be done. Why? Because God says, I am raising something up for you all. That when you look back on it, you wonder. Listen, you wonder why Paul was able to explain the New Testament in the way that he did is because he grabbed hold of the Old Testament. He understood what God was wanting to do. He understood how everything was going to pit fit perfectly in a man named Jesus Christ that would come on the scene that listen there was no sin whatsoever in him he was the spotless lamb of God and what they kept saying that God kept saying the whole time is this make sure make sure make sure because everything is important why because it always leads to my son always leads to my son to be able to understand what's happening if you would, look at verse 12. I'm almost done. 40 more minutes and I am finished. So verse 12 says this. A charge, by the way. Did you realize God gave charges? Did you realize that maybe sometimes we need a charge? <laughs> Anybody ever been shocked? I'm not talking about shocked you heard something. I'm talking about you grabbed hold of the wrong wire. <laughs> Boy, I've been there, and when you get shocked, you know what happens? You throw whatever else is in your other hand. <laughs> well, it really gets you good. Can I tell you, some people in church need to be shocked sometimes. We're holding on to too much. I'll move on. Verse 12. Look at the charge that he gives to him. The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. Now watch this. It shall not go out. It shall not go out. There, there is a part of what he is saying here that God is saying, Hey, I, I need you all to grab hold of. This fire cannot go out. You can't let it go out. You can't get distracted. You can't take your mind off of it. You can't just say, I'll do something else. You can't be tinkering over here. You've got to stay focused on what I have asked you to do. And he says, keep the fire burning. Keep it on the altar. Maybe you're saying there that that's all good, Brother Dwayne, but it also says that the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and give burnt offerings and do that. And yes, I, I understand that part of it, that the wood would be put on there as well to be able to help that burn. But then in the essence, at the morning and the night, they would have the sacrifice that would be laid across as well. And they would do that. You see, then all of a sudden we have to look at verse 13. When we talk about the wood aspect, because in verse 13 it says, The fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. He repeats himself again. It shall not go out. Maybe you're saying this, but Brother Duane, all they would have to do is restart it. All they would have to do is use what they have learned to be able to start the fire, to, to make that happen themselves, to make sure that everything continues to go, just like they did the first time that it got started. But you see, that's it. <laughs> that's it. We have to realize the importance of God saying that it shall not go out. Why would God continually say it shall not go out if they can restart it themselves? If, if it was no big deal for them to conjure up the aspect of fire, for them to be able to set the spark, for them to be everything that they needed to do to say we can do it on their own, why would God be so adamant about saying you cannot let it go out? Maybe it's because of chapter 9. Maybe it's because of that. You see, chapter 9 would begin to tell us that up to this point, the priest and Moses have been given instructions in the aspect of what they're to do. This is the instructional part of it. Now watch. Now watch. Then all of a sudden you get to verse 9, and yes, there is some fire that it talks about that's going. Now listen. Yes, that fire, how was it started? It was started by the priest. But now we've got to get just a little bit deeper. Because if that's all that we start, listen, if that's where we stop and we think that fire can be started by man, then we've missed all of Scripture. 
And the reason God says that it shall not go out. You see chapter 9 and verse 24 it says this, that yes, everything, they had everything going, everything was rolling, everything was good. But watch chapter 9, verse 24, and look what happens. It said, fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the pieces of the fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. Oh, Do you see what happened here? You see, they may have started the fire, but whatever means they had but the problem is this today he said was going to be different all because if you really go back and read in chapter 9 look at what Moses would begin to say Moses would begin to tell them this and says that this is the thing that the Lord commanded you to do that the glory of the Lord may appear to you today oh listen see man may start some fire but God says if you'll do the things I ask you to do I'll set a spark that'll never go out but you've got to work on it you got to make sure you tend it you can't lose distraction you can't be over here just all over the place you've got to tend to the fire say brother Dwayne you're preaching too hard <laughs> I don't think really I, I don't think I even do halfway justice to the word of I think too too many people are sensitive I do believe that and I'm not talking about sensitive to the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about we just don't know how to handle the word of the Lord. Well, you just don't preach the way I like you to preach. Well, pray harder for me. And maybe I'll, I'll preach like Joel Osteen. Don't pray for that. No matter. Whew. See, God says that I'll show you my glory. Now watch this. God says that I'll show you my glory, but you must keep the fire burning if you want to see it. Oh, God. Oh, come on. Well, I'm getting ready to get into something here in a minute that, I mean, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen. Whew. You see, there's many people who have a fire going. But my question would have to be, just like God's question is going to be, who started it? Who started it? See, there's a lot of games being played. And I tell you, not just in this church, but all over the United States of America. People are playing games. And today we talk about Pentecost. And you know what it is? It's just another game. It's how well can we put on the show. Because if my fire goes out, I'll just restart it. Whew. See, now my question would become this. Who blessed the fire that you've got? Leviticus chapter 9 said God blessed their fire. And the glory of the Lord appeared. My question to you is this, who blessed your fire? Now my question would also be this, who anointed your fire? We always talk about, listen, we always talk about wanting to be anointed. But I'll just tell you this, if you ain't got the fire, how are you anointed? If you've let the go, fire go out, how can you be anointed? Realize, God is still adamant about not letting the fire go out. We pay more attention to somebody else's fire than we do our own, and that's what gets us in trouble. <laughs> because if I'm focused on somebody else's fire, guess what's happening to mine? God says, you missed the charge. I charge you that you need to keep your fire going, and you're worried about everybody else's. Ah, you thought you got the message this week. No, it was me. <laughs> Throughout scripture, God has revealed himself through fire. We realize that, right? God reveals himself through fire. Can I tell you, really, it's no different. No, it may not be cloven tongues of fire that we see this morning, but I want you to know God still reveals himself through fire. Too many times in the church, we think people are on fire too much, and we try to put them out, and we try to douse it, and we try to listen. We try to make sure we can stop the oxygen. We try to remove the fuel. We try to do something so that fire kind of burns down a little bit so that they meet our standards instead of meeting God's. God showed up as fire in a mighty way. Scripture says God is a consuming fire. By the way, you know what happened here? If you were to look at Leviticus chapter 9, guess what happened to the offering? Remember what I read to you? 
in, in Leviticus chapter 9, it wasn't a slow burn that was just one piece after one piece after one piece. God said, Swoom. he devoured all of it at one time. And now that sacrifice is gone, but he says this, keep the fire going. Keep the fire going. Thank you for the sacrifice. Thank you for what you put on there. Keep the fire going. Keep the fire going. How's your fire looking? How's your fire looking? See, in Exodus chapter 9, verse 23, God rained down fire on Egypt. Do you remember that? One of the plagues. How did God reveal himself through fire? That's how God revealed himself. You remember 1 Kings chapter 18, the 450 prophets of Baal, right? We remember that story. But do you remember really what was going on? Man, I, I love to preach this story because a lot of times people miss what really is going on in the time frame. You remember what had happened in that time frame? Guess what had happened? No rain. No rain. You know what that meant? That meant a drought. You know what that means? Everything's dried up. You know what that meant to God? God says, now I can just be put on display as more power. How did he reveal himself? He revealed himself through power, through fire. How much was that? Well, it was so much that what he would say was this. He would look at them and say, yeah, I know you 450 prophets of Baal. Y'all are out here cutting yourself and dancing and everything else and doing all these things. But do you remember what he actually said to him? He said, maybe you need to scream just a little bit louder. He said, maybe your God's in the bathroom. You say, he didn't say that. Well, I want you to know, actually, that's what the scripture does say. If you really want to know the truth, you know why? Because he was making fun of a false god. Maybe you need to pray a little bit harder because he can't hear you. Yeah, I'm just saying. You remember what he did, though? Remember in a drought. You remember what he did in a drought? Been three and a half years. Guess what he did? Hey, go get me some barrels of water. Barrels of water? Where'd the water come from? It all, you know what they did? They had some stored up somewhere, but all of a sudden he says this. Hey, go get all the water that you've got left that you think is going to be the thing that's going to save you because all of you all have turned the wrong way and you're serving the bells. And so what I need you to do is I need you to get rid of everything else that you're trying to hold on to. And you think water is your life source. So what I need to do is I need to get all your barrels, right? So he says, pour it on there. No, that ain't enough. Go get the other one. Pour it on. No, that ain't enough. Go get the other one. Pour it on there. And it said that it filled up the trench, right, with water that's in there. That's a lot of water, remember, because we're in a drought. Remember what happens in a drought, right? It's just going to start soaking up. But what happens here? It just fills up the trench. And all of a sudden, he starts praying. Remember that? He starts praying. And what does it say happened? What happened? Fire came down, not just a little bitty bolt of lightning. It said that it consumed the sacrifice, it consumed the altar, it consumed the wood that was doused with it, it consumed the water, and it consumed the dirt. Can I tell you what we need? We need the fire of the Lord on our lives. Because we've got too much stuff that doesn't need to be in our life. And what we need is we need to say, Lord, rain down on me. Not that you want to destroy me, but you want to purify me. Uh, by the way, Leviticus chapter 6. And after it burns up, then you got the ashes and you change your clothes. Why? Because now all these things have become new. You put on the other clothes, take it out, get rid of that stuff because you don't need it in your life. That's what the power of the Holy Spirit does. No, I didn't preach from Acts chapter 2 this morning. Would you all come on up? I didn't preach from Acts chapter 2 this morning. Because the Lord said Leviticus chapter 6 is pretty important. And it shows really what I'm talking about. God would say, this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the fire. See, we need to fire in the church. But my question, leaders, is this. Hey, board members. Hey, pastor. Hey, pastors. Where's our fire at? Come on. You know what we've got? To, I've got to examine myself. You know what I've been doing this week? Examining myself. It does no good for me to stand up here and preach if I hadn't examined myself. So I've examined myself. And you know what the Lord said? You're too worried about this? So guess what I did? Well, Lord, I'll start my fire. It's easy to do. You know what we say? I'll take care of that. I'll get that out of my life. I'll remove that. And God says, you do it and you'll make a mess. God says, all I need you to do is pray. Say, Lord, I'm sorry. Remove that from my life. Boom! And the fire rains down. You know what it turns into? Ashes. 
Because guess what we need? We need the fire that is representative of the power of the Holy Spirit to come into our lives to help us to look a little bit different because we've been holding on to too much stuff that we really need turned into ashes. And then take that scoop and get it out. <laughs> oh, me. Lord, I thought it was good. Thank you for giving it to me. But anyway, we're looking at this. Can I tell you, that's not the only time. You remember 2 Chronicles chapter 7? Oh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Man, that was a wonderful day. You know what it was? It was the day that Solomon dedicated the temple. He dedicated the temple to the Lord. If you were to go back to Jewish tradition and their history, what they would say is this. Leviticus chapter 9, when the fire, watch this, when the fire of the glory of God shot out and all the people began to praise him, they said this. Now watch, they said this. From that day until the day Solomon dedicated the temple, that fire never went out because they were obedient to the word. And they kept the fire going. And then all of a sudden we've got the new temple and God says this in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Solomon would pray a prayer that lasted quite a long time. And it says when he got done, the fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. How's your fire looking? How's your fire looking? You see, it's Pentecost Sunday. And I still believe... The same fire that rained down from heaven. The same fire that was given on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The same fire that we read all throughout the scriptures. Is still the same fire that God wants to give to us today. Sometimes, Now watch this. Sometimes it's to eliminate some of the stuff we don't need in our lives. But you read the rest of the book of Acts and you know what it is? Other times. Now watch this. Other times is to equip us for the ministry that we've got to do. By the way, you are a minister, and if you try to say that you're not, then you're calling the word of the Lord a liar. Because if you name the name of Jesus Christ, you are a minister. If you name the name of Jesus Christ, then you do need the power of the Holy Spirit to be alive in your life. Because if not, you've got too much junk Amen. that you're holding on to. Amen. And you can't do ministry if you're holding on to junk. And so what really has got to happen is this. We need the power that we would see come down. Yes, get rid of that. But we also need the power that they prayed for to give us boldness to go out and proclaim the name of Jesus. And it says the place that they were at was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that represent? The fire that would come down. Can I tell you? Some of us need to be shaken up just a little bit this morning. We become too lazy in the church. We become too laid back. We might as well got recliners and put them in here. When's the last time fire fell in your life? I, don't, I didn't ask when you got saved. I'm not asking about when you got sanctified. I can take you to do both places of when both of those things happened to me. But I'll tell you what. That wasn't the last time that the fire of God fell in my life. And I pray it's not the last time he ever falls in my life again. My question to you is this. When's the last time he fell in your life? Maybe if it's never happened, today can be the day. <laughs> you say, well, Brother Dwayne, I just don't understand all this stuff about entire sanctification and sanctification and being set apart. And being... Then just let God deal with you. Because watch it, the Holy Spirit's a better teacher than I could ever be to you. So you let him deal with you with whatever you're dealing with right now in your life. You know why? Because he knows best. He knows what you're struggling with. He knows what you're holding on to. He knows all the things that are going on right now in your life. And so you know what you need? You need him. You don't need me. You don't need the piano. You don't need somebody else. You don't need a song leader. You don't need these things. What you need is him and him alone. And he'll write down in your life. Maybe some of you all, you need the boldness to be able to proclaim the name of Jesus like never before. Can I tell you what he wants to do today? He wants to give that to you. That's what he wants to do. Not just because we talk about Pentecost Sunday, but because that's how gracious and merciful and an almighty God that we serve is that he does want to do it today. Maybe there's some of you all that, man, you are living right. And you're walking with the Lord. And man, God, listen, and the fire that is revealed in your life is being revealed to other people as well. You know how other people are going to see it? Because your fire hadn't gone out. You say, Pastor, you're saying you can tell when other people's fire going out? You make that call. <laughs> I'll go ahead and tell. 
You know where I stand on that. And if all, all these preaching these years that I've been here, you don't realize where I stand on that, then we probably don't know each other very well. And we need to sit down and talk. <laughs> and I'm asking, when's the last time? Because even if it was this morning before you got here, praise God for that. But guess what? He wants to do it again. Why? Because really, God wants to give us as much as we can handle of who He is because He wants us closer to Him. He wants us to look more like Him. He wants us to have the fruit of the Spirit. And the fruit of the Spirit only comes through the Spirit. And so if the fire of God hadn't rained down in your life, then how can you tell somebody that you've got the fruit of the Spirit if you've never experienced the Spirit? By the way, that's Scripture, not me. And so all of a sudden we look at this and we say, where are we at? As well, Pastor, you just preach too hard. Well, let the Holy Spirit deal with me, but I hope that he deals with all of us. And we'll move from there. But the thing is this. I'll just tell you, i got to be careful myself. Because, Peggy, I don't want to become lazy in the things of God. I don't want to pick my Bible up just to read it, just to read it. I don't want to get to that place. I don't want those things to happen. But I want to when I read, when I pray, when I sing, when I'm at church, when I'm in my vehicle, when I'm at home, when whatever it is, I want the power of God to be put on display. And so this morning, this morning, even now, as y'all play, go ahead and play. This morning, the Holy Spirit is speaking now. Pastor Dwayne's done. It ain't, it ain't about me speaking anymore. It's about what the Holy Spirit's saying into your life. And just remember, just remember once again that on the day of judgment, you're going to be held accountable to what the Holy Spirit spoke into your life as well. Mm. What do you want from the Lord this morning? Are you happy with the pat on the back from somebody in church that tells you you're doing a good job? Or are you more happy with doing Jesus' words that says, get into your prayer closet, and what you do in secret, God will reward you? Because I want you to know, I'm, I'm not looking for anyone this morning to pat me on the back, to tell me how good of a job or not good of a job that I did, because really it doesn't matter what anybody says, it matters what the Lord's already told me. And this morning, that's for all of us.